how our evolutionary story is concocted. Hobbit Wars, the evolution of an ape man, this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now, our topic this week is Hobbit War, <laughs> the evolution of an ape man. That's, That's what we're right. talking about. This week we're going to talk about hominids, or so-called ape men, that were nicknamed hobbits. Uh, zeroing in on one specific find to show you just how evolutionary stories are fashioned. How they're not fact, but interpretation. And how evidence about what happened in the past is historical science rather than operational science. So this isn't the type of science that gives us automobiles or computers or you know medical technology or anything like that, right? It's right, a different type yeah. of science. Evolutionists often rail against creationists as being against science or not believing in science. We hear these kinds of things. Not true, of course. Uh, what they fail to recognize is the difference between what we can see and touch and test and the stories that are made up in an attempt to explain how those things got to be the way they are today. Right, so Huge when creationists say they don't believe what evolutionists do, right? we're not rejecting uh, science, we're right. rejecting the made up explanations that try to explain the past through a purely naturalistic filter, yes. right? That, that omits God and his word before the investigation even starts. So, so this is the difference between operational science and historical science, which of course we've discussed many times, but yes. we still continue to need to mention it. Yeah, the foundational <laughs> issue. So the standard, over, the, the standard overall big picture of evolutionary theory is that all living things came from a single source, which itself came from some inorganic form. No life, then first life, then it diversifies and branches out and becomes every living thing that is or ever has been on, uh, on planet Earth. Right, except for the aliens that have visited us, of course. Except for the aliens. So, yeah. right. So, so part of this big picture is that humans must have uh, descended from a creature most similar to us, right? And uh, right. that, of course, would be apes. So evolutionists believe that humans and apes evolved from a common ancestor and that the ape closest to humans today would be the chimpanzee. Right, so once you start with that filter, you automatically fit any evidence you find into that filter, into what you believe is true about the past, and work from there. So if you find bones, for example, that have any real similarity to humans, but are different in some aspect, then they usually start assigning them to hominid, or ape man status, or at least some, some uh, category of, of primitive humans, something like that. Right, and we've covered a lot of these so-called hominids uh, right. uh, yep. before, uh, some of the famous hoaxes, and uh, and so you can you can check those out actually in Creation Magazine Live, uh, like uh, episode 13 of season one, episode 23 of season two. Um, of course, what scientists are finding are either bones of apes or humans, <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. The, this missing link is just that, it's missing. The reason, is, of course, is that because there's no link. <laughs> They're looking for something that isn't there. Humans and apes were created separately by God from the beginning, and both kinds of creatures have an incredible amount of variation within their own kinds, right. so much that the size of each kind can often overlap. This can cause evolutionists to mistake one for the other, and they believe that you know, there were ones in between links or, or hybrids along the way from ape to man, of course. Right, yeah, for example, uh, here's a picture of humans with extreme variations in height. Robert Waldo and Lucia uh, Zarati. Lucia was 26 inches tall and Robert was eight feet 11 inches tall, nearly <laughs> nine feet tall. Both were fully human, you can see there, they're fully human, so a lot of what we see reported as primitive humans are likely just people falling within the normal range of variation seen in humans or the normal range of variation seen in apes. Absolutely. Uh, so this episode will also reveal how evolution uh, as a concept is kept very active in the consciousness of Western yeah. society by constantly declaring there's new evidence for evolution. Well, usually, 
years later, um, when the evidence has, uh, has failed, the general public usually doesn't see that. They don't see right. the rebuttal or whatever. The yeah. general impression is that scientists are constantly finding new evidence for evolution all the time and uh, bolstering their, their idea. Yeah, and this week we're going to look at one very specific case, yep. uh, the so-called hobbit fossils yep. found on the island of Flores in Indonesia, and we'll get into that in just a minute. In nature documentaries and science textbooks, one often hears about creatures that arrived at their body plan very early in evolutionary history and have not made any real changes since that time, supposedly millions of years ago. These are called living fossils, like the coelacanth and the Walmy pine. This phenomenon is known as stasis, things staying pretty much the same. And it turns out that pretty much every animal in the entire fossil record appears suddenly and shows this same history of stasis. This was not predicted by evolution. A more recent and radical theory called punctuated equilibrium recognises stasis in the fossil record but requires belief in rapid massive leaps in evolution, an unsubstantiated just-so story. However, the physical evidence, sudden appearance and stasis in the fossil record fits remarkably well with the biblical account of a recent creation followed by a devastating global flood, just as the Bible describes in Genesis. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. If you just tuned in, we're talking this week about Hobbit War, <laughs> the evolution of an ape man. So let's get at some of the background about these, these Hobbit fossils. Well, in 2003, Australian and Indonesian scientists discovered small-bodied, small-brained hominin or human-like fossils on the remote island of Flores in the uh, Indonesian arch archipelago. And this was claimed to be um, the discovery of a new human species, which was called Homo floresiensis. All right. Uh, researchers William Jungers, a PhD, and Karen Babb, also a PhD, studied the skeletal remains of female that they, they labeled LB1, nicknamed Little Lady of Flores, or, or Flo, uh, to attempt to confirm the evolutionary path of the, the, the hobbit species. Uh, the specimen was mostly complete and included a uh, skull, jaw, arms, legs, hands, feet, that provided researchers with, an integrate, with, with integrated information from these fossils. Right. So, so the complete set. So the cranial capacity of uh, LB1 was just over 400 centimeters, making it more similar to the brains of a chimpanzee, or so-called bipedal ape men of East and South Africa. It was claimed that the skull and jawbone features were much more primitive looking than any uh, normal modern human. Okay. Uh, now this report came out with uh, great fanfare and had the evolution, com the evolutionary community buzzing. Um, all sorts of drawings and depictions were seen in news reports showing these small, primitive little hobbit people <laughs> looking quite ape-like, giving seemingly more proof that mankind descended from apes in a, in a Darwinian fashion. Right. Kind of and of course, the, the first Lord of the Rings movie uh, featuring uh, the very human-like, but short hobbits came out yes. in 2001. That was quite popular. And the third movie came out in December of 2003. So the nickname Hobbit uh, certainly added to the intrigue of the discovery, um, you know, to the average person who might not have really paid attention otherwise. Right? Right. Hey, we found hobbits. Okay. We found <laughs> hobbits. Now, to put this in perspective as to how the average person was taught about this finding, let's read some quotes from a 2004 article from National Geographic. Uh, they said there, Homo florensis has been described as one of the most spectacular discoveries in paleoanthropology in half a century, and the most extreme human ever discovered. The species inhabited Flores as recently as 13,000 years ago, which means it would have lived at the same time as modern humans, scientists say. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting quote. Right, and continuing. To find that as recently as perhaps 13,000 years ago, there was another upright, bipedal, though small-brained creature walking the planet at the same time as modern humans is as exciting as it was unexpected, said Peter Brown, a paleoanthropologist at the University of New England in New South Wales, Australia. And, and a little bit further, it says, uh, it, it is totally unexpected, said Chris Stringer, director of human or the, the Human Origins Program at the, National, uh, the, the uh, Natural History Museum in London. To have early humans on the remote island of Flores is surprising enough, 
that some are only about a meter tall with the chimp-sized brain is even more remarkable, that they were still there less than 20,000 years ago, and that modern humans must have met them is astonishing. Well, the first thing we see here, of course, is all this talk about how this is, you know, amazing and exciting and astonishing and et cetera, yeah, but yeah. is it really? I mean, without a belief in evolution, you've either found some smaller humans or some ape bones, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> the first statement you read <laughs> said it was uh, the most extreme human ever found. But we already saw that Lucia Zarati was far smaller than the one meter tall hobbit that right. they are talking about here. So these hobbits would have been uh, much taller than Lucia, and it's not like scientists haven't known, uh, you know, not just individual cases of shorter people, but of whole people groups who are shorter than this for a long time now. Yeah, right? yeah. So. yeah, and there are many little people in the world today. Some suffer from dwarfism. Dwarfism is a a short stature resulting from a medical condition. It's sometimes defined as, uh, as an adult height of less than four feet, 10 inches, about 147 centimeters. Although this definition is problematic because short stature in itself is not a disorder. Exactly. Dwarfism can be caused by about 200 distinct medical conditions such uh, that the symptoms and characteristics of individual people with dwarfism vary greatly. Many people uh, with dwarfism prefer to be called small people, by the way. <laughs> right. right. Uh, but aside from uh, this, there's, uh, there are whole people groups around the world with the majority of the population of short stature, mm -hmm. just like there are some that are taller. Right. The African pygmy tribes, for example, are typically quite short. So the fossils found fall well within the human range for height of fully human people on the planet today. And we'll get into some more details in just a minute. What are the theological consequences of adding millions of years to Genesis? How does it impact doctrines such as the gospel, sin, the atonement? Refuting compromise is the most powerful biblical and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis. Loaded with scientific support for a recent creation in six real days, it demolishes all attempts to twist the biblical text in order to insert millions of years, bringing clarity into an area usually mired in confusion. Must reading for Bible college students and anyone involved in church leadership or teaching. Get your copy at creation.com. On this week's episode, we're talking about Hobbit Wars, the evolution of an ape man. That's right. We were mentioning that these uh, Hobbit or, or Homo floresiensis fossils fell within normal human range for height. But uh, how do they, uh, how do they get, get that way? The, the African pygmy, pygmy tribes, for example, are typically quite short, but not all of them uh, get short in the same way. Right, that's true, yeah. Not all pygmies grow alike. The, the backup people of West Africa are born at typical sizes, but grow much more slowly during their first two years uh, than, than non-pygmies. However, other African pygmy tribes grow differently. In East Africa, the Sua and Efi people give birth to smaller than average babies. So there's different ways that, that they stay right. short. George Perry, an assistant professor of uh, anthropology and biology at Pennsylvania State University said, a research he and his colleagues published in 2014 suggested various pigment groups have different genetic mechanisms responsible for the short stature. As one study uh, covered in Live Science said, our res uh, results suggest that genetic and endocrine, which is hormonal, processes acting during infancy are involved in establishing differences between pygmy and non-pygmy groups by adapting adult stature to environmental pressure, the researchers wrote in the study. So obviously different programmed, as in not random, genetic factors within us can account for size differences in people, and not just people, but other creatures as well. But what else? Well, I mean, obviously disease, right? Right. Um, yep. You know, within a very short time after the unprecedented uh, commotion surrounding the finding of these hobbits, an alternative hypothesis was proposed. And uh, what if they were just diseased humans? <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, in a 2004 report, Indonesian scientists refuted many of the sensational evolutionary claims about Flores man. And actually, at this point, the skeleton was claimed to be female. Uh, the, the country's influential Jakarta report ran an article on November 8, 2004, entitled R.I. Scientists Refute Flores Man Finding. R.I. stands for Republic of Indonesia, by the way. Yeah, that, that article uh, reports Dr. Uh, Tiku Jacob, a paleoanthropology professor from uh, Gajah uh, Mata University, as saying, 
The skeleton is not a new species as claimed by these scientists, but simply a fossil of a modern human, Homo sapiens, that lived about 13 to 1800 years ago. Okay. 1800. 1800, yeah, <sighs> not a million. While acknowledging the, the small brain size, the 380 cc, uh, less than that of a chimp, and obvious differences with typical modern humans, he apparently stated that the remains were those of a member of the, uh, he says here, the Australomalazand race, which had dwelled across almost all of the Indonesian islands. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Referring to the skeleton's eye socket shape and hip bone curves, uh, Jacob suggested that it was not a woman at all, but, the, uh, but a male who died around age 30. Now, interestingly, he also criticized as unethical the actions of the Australian scientist who initially announced the discovery. Right. So Yes, both Jacob and Professor uh, Dr. R.P. Uh, Sejano, head of uh, Indonesia's National Archaeology Institute, said that the, the Australians should have involved them when making the announcement, especially considering that the Australian scientists were not there when the discovery was made. Uh, Sejano uh, se claimed that the work on floors was actually started by Indonesian scientists in 1976 and uh, for forced a halt to the 1997 uh, Asian... Uh, it was halted because of the Asian financial crisis. Yeah, so a, a bit of drama there. Yeah. Uh, now, whether the refutation was influenced in part by turf wars mm. uh, and or national sensitivities, it's interesting that the professional academic paleoanthropologists could have two such radically different views about both the identification and, the, and, and particularly the age of this specimen. Well, it sure does. <laughs> and it, it highlights the fact that this area of origins, again, is historical, not operational science. Right. Both yep. groups of scientists are, are examining the same facts and coming to different conclusions. Facts don't speak for themselves. Uh, now, certainly the biblical creationist view is not um, harmed, if, if anything, uh, the opposite by this uh, Indonesian opinion. So we have real scientists on our side. So to speak. Yeah, yeah. The in Indonesian comments about a pygmy Austral Malaysian group of people is interesting because many of the reports from missionaries to that area, mostly from the early part of last century and before, often include what they called the little people. Right. These report, reports mostly concerning the far northern regions of Australia, hence closer to Indonesia, were uh, of an allegedly distinct, um, a very small humans, that is, a, 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 a a group quite distinguishable from local aboriginals. Uh, could at least some of these have been uh, the same or closely related people group as uh, those whose skeletons have been found on floors? Mm. Well, we'll find out more when we get back. Dogs vary greatly in size, from Chihuahua to Great Dane, yet they are all part of the dog or wolf-created kind. They can all interbreed. Researchers have found that the small breeds of dog have something in common, a mutation in a gene that codes for an important growth regulator. This prevents the small dogs growing to normal size. Mutations do that sort of thing. They destroy normal biological functions. Some of that destruction might be entertaining for us, producing cute miniature dogs that don't cost much to feed. But mutations won't create the complex blocks of genetic instructions needed to produce the growth regulator in the first place. Evolutionists say that mutations change dinosaurs into birds and apes into people. But how can mutations which destroy complex information do that sort of thing? Modern biology really shouts creation, not evolution. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, our subject today is Hobbit Wars, the evolution of an ape man. Uh, we were mentioning that uh, soon after the discovery of the Homo floriensis, um, fossils were found. Other evolutionary scientists who examined the bones declared they weren't proto-humans at, uh, at all, but fully human. Right. Uh, in, uh, in addition, the bones were found in a cave, uh, and they were apparently not fossilized. They weren't mineralized. Due to the damp climate, they had the consistency of, quote, wet blotting paper. Yeah. They were soggy so to speak. Right. So given this, long ages uh, would uh, themselves get a bit wary about the ages assigned to them. I mean, the youngest date for the bones uh, themselves is said to be about 18,000 years, ranging to more than 38,000. Um, right. The remains have many features very similar to Homo erectus, which we have 
long maintained that it's just a variety of Homo sapiens, right. they're, they're fully human. Yeah. Now, the uh, original group that found these bones objected to them being called fully human and pointed to of the course. skull and brain <laughs> size as proof of that, that they weren't fully human. But again, we've seen many little people whose brain capacity was very small who were fully human. Right. right. And uh, although brain size may matter to some degree, Neanderthals, which are, were often depicted as less than intelligent, uh, less than modern man anyway, had a larger brain size than modern humans, but were, we, but were considered more intelligent than, uh, than these cavemen by most people. Right. And there's, there's pathological conditions that can lead to people developing very small heads or brains. Uh, just such a proposal was offered by an, uh, in an article in Britain's Observer that quotes Dr. Jacob suggesting the uh, abnormality known as microcephaly, uh, wh uh, which is where a human is born with a, a smaller brain size, was responsible for Flora's man's small brain skull size, etc. Okay. This is disputed by well-known human evolution authority, Britain's Dr. Chris Stringer, who points out that Flores Man has other features, not just reduced brain, that there are distinct, that, that, and those features are distinct from typical humans today. Right. That up. However, <laughs> an, an item posted in 2004 by anatomy professor uh, Marcia Hennenberg gives significant support to the florist man uh, was a, a microcephalic uh, view. So back and forth we go. You can see how different people are interpreting it different ways. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, this is a condition, by the way, where the head is smaller than normal. It can be caused by genetic abnormalities, uh, by drugs, by alcohol, uh, uh, certain viruses and toxins that are exposed to the fetus during pregnancy and damage the developing brain tissue. Right, yes. Now, Hindenburg is the head of the Department of Anatomy at uh, South Australia's Adelaide University and has studied human evolution for 32 years. He says that the dimensions of the face, nose, and jaws don't differ significantly from those of modern humans, unlike the very small brain case. He says, um, the bell rang in my head as he recalled a Minoan period human skull from Crete, which has long been identifi identified as that of a microcephalic. Uh, Professor Hennenberg says that, uh, during, uh, that doing a statistical comparison of the two skulls using detailed dimensions provided by the, the Nature website, yeah. uh, he, he says it shows that there is not a single difference between the two skulls, though one is reputedly that of a new species of human, the other is a member of a sophisticated culture that, pre, that preceded classical Greek civilization. <laughs> Hindenburg also says that deeper down in the same cave on floors, a radius, which is a forearm bone, was discovered, and its length of 210 millimeters suggests that its owner was 151 to 162 centimeters, which is five foot three uh, inches tall, which is well within normal human range today, and probably consistent with a healthy, good-sized member of these little people. Okay, so once again, we see that this isn't like operational science, where you're making observations in real time and no one argues with the result because they can be repeated. Yeah. As we've highlighted before, if you wanna see what temperature water boils at at sea level, or what organs the, the organs are inside a rabbit, for example, yeah. or, or the effects of gravity on two falling objects, no one argues with the conclusions because other people can repeat those activities. Exactly. Obviously, we're dealing with something different here. And we'll be back in just a moment. With all the responsibilities that most pastors have, it is often too much to ask them to keep up with all the latest science that supports the Bible and creation. The Information Department at CMI reviews the leading evolutionary science publications so that our scientists and speakers are both constantly updated with the latest evolutionist information and able to refute it. Give your pastor a break. Book a CMI speaker into your church for a faith-strengthening Sunday morning message. Visit creation.com to contact your nearest CMI office. Our subject today is Hobbit Wars, the evolution of an ape man. Now what we've seen so far is from 2003 to 2004, different scientists who believe in evolution came to quite different conclusions about the so-called hobbit bones. Um, some said that it was a new species. Some said they were fully human, perhaps suffering from some kind of a disease, uh, probably ancestors of modern pygmies that live nearby. Yeah. Then in 2005, 
the Herald Sun in Australia released a news report stating that there's a group of pygmies living about a kilometer from the cave where the hobbit bones were found. Why wasn't that mentioned in the initial reports? That's brilliant. <laughs> now, now think through this assumption. Or, or think through this without the assumption of evolution, rather. Yeah. Given all the facts discovered, shouldn't someone have come to the conclusion that they were just grave robbing? <laughs> I mean, there, there are people a kilometer away that are of similar size, and your first thought is to concoct a story of, of some imagined early human, and uh, the, the blindness here is, is staggering. Yeah, but see, <laughs> if you're gonna say that you found some graves of sick humans, that that's, isn't gonna ignite the imagination of yeah. the evolutionary community and right. the people you're trying to convince. It's not gonna pay the salaries of uh, the artists who come up with these fanciful drawings yeah. uh, 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 or sell books about these so-called evolutionary creatures. You know, as one book review said about uh, the topic, the hobbits are able to generate media attention globally. These three feet, feet tall hominids are so interesting to the general public, it seems clear that Morwood's and Van Oostries' book will be an immediate success. Amazing. Yeah. Since 2003, there have been numerous reports in Science Magazine and Nature Magazine and newspapers and on, uh, online articles going back and forth as to whether these bones should be classified as a new species or not, with, with several expert scientists weighing in. You, you can see a summary of, of this history, actually, in an article on our website called Hobbit, uh, Hobbit New News is Good News, creation.com slash Hobbit News. You can get some of that information there. Uh, regardless, uh, what's been uh, happening is all of this infighting is proving to be an embarrassment to the evolutionary community right. because it demonstrates that evolution is certainly not a fact, yeah, even though it's presented that way, of course. Yeah, yeah, and it's certainly highlighting the difference between operational and historical science. Yeah. If, if this was the same type of science that can make cars or satellites, there wouldn't be any of these various interpretations. It seems that creationist assessments about the whole affair have also caused embarrassment. One report said, uh, said this, it's wrong for them to do what they do, but we certainly make it easy for them when, they have, when we have disagreements like this one. I think that a lot of what has been said is going to have to be retracted. Given the amount of media attention, it makes the field look incompetent. His conclusion is, everybody wants a piece of this, nobody's on the side of the angels right now. <laughs> I mean, that's an interesting <laughs> comment, isn't it? It's wrong for creationists to criticize evolutionists, but it's okay if they criticize each, each other. Yeah, that's so, amazing. Here we have this completely concocted story. If you'd just gone with Common sense, so to speak. Oh, look, we found the burial grounds of some people that live over there a <laughs> kilometer away, and we're going to make up some yeah. uh, ape man. Evolution is actually anti science. You, you apply, you have that way of thinking, and it causes things like we've just talked about in the last half hour. Amazing. Yeah. You want some more information? This show is called Creation Magazine Live. It's based on Creation Magazine, the same kind of information that you hear on this show you can get in Creation Magazine. View a free copy at creation.com slash freemag. And we'll see you next week with creation and marriage. That's our topic next week.